Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDOP and ESTCP. Today's webinar will consist of a brief overview of both programs, followed by two technical presentations. First, Dr. Liba Peshar from Colorado State University will discuss research efforts to evaluate cross-boundary habitat crediting programs, and she will also provide recommendations on which types of programs are suited to which contexts. Liba's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session, and then Dr. Mark Davis from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign will summarize his research on using emerging environmental DNA or eDNA chemistry and technology to improve measuring and monitoring of pollinator biodiversity in the Anthropocene. Uh, Mark's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer interactive Q&A session featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you are unable to download Zoom, you may view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you are unable to view the slides uh, or if your screen freezes, just try keying in Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. Now, if you're accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a um, comment using the chat box, but please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for today's speakers. And if you continue to have difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage shown here and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Note that we will be live streaming the webinar on the CERDUP and ESTCP YouTube channel at the link shown here. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit your questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to just submit your questions as you think of them. And when submitting your questions, please add your organization name at the end of it so that we can identify you during the Q&A sessions. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Herb Nelson, who is the Executive Director of CERDOP and ESCCP. Herb served as the Program Manager for the Munitions Response Area, Program Area between 2008 and 2016. And prior to joining CERDOP and ESCCP, he served as a Research Chemist and Head of the Molecular dynamic section at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, where his work focused on the detection and classification of buried unexploded ordnance. Chair, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this webinar, the CERN, the CERTIP and ACCP webinar series. I'm pinch hitting today for uh, Kurt Preston, who would normally be doing this, but he had a last minute conflict. So uh, you'll get me, we'll see how it goes. So as uh, many of you on the phone, maybe almost all of you on the phone know, we are really two programs. The first, of course, is CERTUP, and it's the longest uh, lived of the two. That's the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. And as it says on the slide, it was established by Congress in 91. We're a partnership among the three agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. So the goal of CERTUP, as it says in these uh, the third large bullet in the sub bullets to look at uh, technologies that can uh, can address the environmental needs and uh, issues facing the Department of Defense. 
we are fortunate and they were able to uh, support research that ranges from basic research through advanced development. So we can see a problem almost all the way through to the solution. And the next step might be our, our uh, companion program, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. It's a sort of a silly acronym, but it's got historic roots. This is a DOD only program and it's what the Department of Defense calls a demonstration validation program, where we take technologies that may have been developed in CERTIP or may have been developed other places and demonstrate them in an actual defense installation. So we can, can, we can collect real time cost and performance data. And at the end, the report out of an ESCCP project will be that it worked better or it didn't and it cost less or it didn't. And of course we want the answer to both of those to be yes, but obviously all of you are researchers, you know it's not always yes. Uh, the, the final goal of the ESTCP project is really to promote implementation. Many of our technologies uh, impact on the DOD cleanup program, and so we're looking to interact with regulators, facilitating regulatory acceptance. Others are, are DOD um, maintenance facilities and depots, and so in that case, we're looking to impact the people in charge of those facilities. So we have uh, four program areas in both CERTIP and ESDCP, and they are from the top here, environmental restoration, which is traditional chemical cleanup, installation energy and water, which is uh, only an ESDCP program, munitions response, which is in both, and that's a cleanup of unexploded ordnance, resource conservation and resiliency, which you'll see in a minute is the subject of today's webinar, and then finally, weapon systems and platforms. And that's a little bit of an opaque name if you're not a DOD person, but that's really what I referred to earlier. All things about the DOD industrial base, maintenance facilities, depots, repair, and ways to handle those things in environmentally more responsible methods. So as I've said a couple of times here, today, the source of today's, uh, the, the subject of today's webinar is from the Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program area. And Kurt Preston, who I mentioned earlier, is the program manager in that area. So Research Conservation and Resiliency really looks at three large buckets of uh, need. Natural resources, which is the subject of today's presentations. But they also have a significant component, as the uh, name of the program says, in resilience. And then also air quality. We do a lot of work on wildland fire dynamics. We do, uh, we've done a significant amount of work in the past on fugitive dust, particularly from ranges in the West. So it's a pretty broad uh, ranging program. So uh, here is a list of the upcoming webinars for your interest. You can see that we rotate through many of the program areas. I think all but uh, insulation, energy, and water represented on the next, through the next five. Moving from hazardous materials and uh, weapon systems, repair facilities in particular, that is, um, an underwater munitions mobility seminar, a couple of uh, seminars in a row on managing aqueous film forming foam, which is really driven by the uh, increased emphasis on per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS contamination. And then finally, looping back again in the first one in November to the resource conservation and resiliency area to focus on the uh, resiliency part of the program area. So all of that, of course, is listed on our website. Uh, you can go always to tools and training or webinar series. There's also often a link on the front for, on the homepage to this. So I would encourage you, if you any of those topics pique your interest, and if you're home and you're bored, and so you're looking for something to learn something new, maybe it would pique your interest that it normally wouldn't. So please visit the webinar page, and if they are of interest to you, please sign up. Of course, uh, again, many of you know, CERTIP and ESTCB have an annual symposium. It has been in Washington, D.C. for as long as I've been associated with CERTIP and ESTCP. Of course, this year is virtual because like many of these meetings, it is virtual. It is the week after Thanksgiving, which is our traditional week, but the beauty this year is there'll be no getting on airplanes the week after Thanksgiving. You can just do it virtually. So uh, you, can get a, uh, you can get a link to the registration from the, our, web page, our homepage of our website. So please do that and you can register now or set yourself a reminder to register later. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Ruler, who will introduce Lee by our first speaker. Thank you so much, Herb. It is now my Pleasure to introduce Dr. Liba Peshar. 
who is an associate professor in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University. Liba's research focuses on conserving and restoring bird and mammal communities in human-dominated landscapes, including military lands. Liba is trained as an ecologist, but she often works closely with social scientists to seek interdisciplinary solutions to sustaining biodiversity and human well-being in the places where people live and work. Uh, Liba earned a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science from Middlebury College in Vermont and a doctoral degree in environmental studies from the University of California in Santa Cruz. Liba, please proceed. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and hello, I'm so pleased and grateful to have the opportunity to talk with all of you today uh, about our one year limited scope project funded by CERTA titled A Multidisciplinary Assessment of Habitat Crediting Programs for Threatened and Endangered Species. This project was done in close collaboration with my colleagues at Colorado State University, Erica Fleischman, Julie Heinrich, Kristen Davis, and Priscilla Arana, and our colleague Drew Bennett at the University of Wyoming. We are an interdisciplinary team of conservation biologists and conservation social scientists. So I'd like to start by outlining the agenda for today's talk. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the concept of cross-boundary habitat conservation, uh, focusing specifically on habitat crediting programs, talk about the objectives for our particular project and how we approach uh, our uh, testing and evaluating those objectives. I'd like to highlight some of our key findings and then talk specifically about how those findings could be of benefit to the Department of Defense and what might be some next steps to furthering and advancing our understanding of the use of habitat crediting programs and cross-boundary conservation uh, by DOD and partner organizations. So as many of you know, the Department of Defense's primary mission is to deter war and to ensure national security. And that requires training uh, on a diverse suite of lands and waters across the United States. And DOD has demonstrated a strong commitment to environmental stewardship on those lands. And in fact, a disproportionate number of rare species occur on Department of Defense lands. So this figure along the x-axis shows a number of of federal agencies that are land managers in the U.S., the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Defense, Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service. And on the y-axis is the number of species uh, per 100,000 hectares uh, on these lands. And the, the dark bars show species that are federally listed as threatened or endangered, and the light bars is those that are other types of species of conservation concern. And you can see here clearly that there's a much higher density of, of imperiled species or species of conservation concern on Department of Defense land. So preserving this, these, this you know, incredible richness of species in their habitats uh, does support mission readiness on installations. However, occasionally negative effects on imperiled species are unavoidable. Uh, because of the training that's required in order to meet the primary mission of the DOD. Cross-boundary partnerships can help alleviate uh, some of the regulatory burden that could be associated uh, with conserving these species and potentially compromising these training missions by providing flexibility and positive outcomes for DOD, for their uh, partners, in conservation and also for the species of conservation concern. So cross-boundary habitat conservation includes a suite of innovative tools that are gaining traction across the United States and globally. This approach is really consistent with DOD's stated priorities to strengthen alliances and to attract new partners. So the Sentinel Landscapes Program is a great example of this approach where DOD uh, biologists and managers are working actively with partners in the same landscape to manage uh, uh, conservation uh, priorities and challenges uh, that, are, that are common across those jurisdictional boundaries. 
Similarly, the central photo here illustrates the concept of conservation easements, which are an increasingly common tool uh, also used by DOD, especially in buffer areas. And finally, on the right-hand side is a gopher tortoise, and this is meant to illustrate a new, a relatively new and emerging tool for cross-boundary conservation uh, titled Habitat Crediting Programs. So these programs hold a lot of promise but remain relatively poorly understood, in part because they're, they're relatively new. And so I'd like to go ahead and define what we mean by habitat crediting program. Uh, so again, this is a form of cross-boundary conservation. These are voluntary programs, and these are programs that provide an incentive, usually an economic or monetary incentive, in return for specific and quantifiable management actions that mitigate current or future impacts to the habitat of threatened or endangered species or candidate species for listing. And so um, just to provide a specific example, uh, these habitat crediting programs might be appropriate where an installation is looking to uh, uh, perhaps build some new infrastructure or start a new training regime that could end up negatively impacting a species of conservation concern, a listed species or candidate species on an installation. And to avoid compromising the primary mission of the installation uh, to, to provide that training, uh, then they could actively work with private landowners in the region to protect and restore habitat for that species, resulting in no net loss of habitat or population sizes of that species, and then providing greater flexibility and uh, uh, reduced regulatory burden to the installation to move ahead with those trainings. So ideally, habitat credit programs provide multiple benefits. So they help DOD uh, pursue their primary mission of military readiness. They also uh, contribute to the recovery, potentially the recovery and delisting of imperiled species, which in turn also reduces regulatory burden on DOD and other organizations. And they also have the potential to provide a new source, a new flow of conservation finance to private landowners. So private landowners that are looking to restore or protect habitat for rare species may not otherwise have uh, many sources of funding to get that work done. So in theory, this could be a win-win-win for DOD imperiled species and private landowners. So the objectives of our one year limited scope CERDIP project were to identify and characterize habitat crediting programs across the United States. So surprisingly, there is no central repository or central list of habitat crediting programs that have occurred. And so our first step was simply to identify those uh, that have occurred or have been developed and to characterize them. We were also interested in assessing how program goals and, uh, were, were identified and how success was evaluated. Next, we also synthesized stakeholder perceptions of strengths and shortcomings associated with these programs. So the degree to which they are meeting these goals for DOD target species and uh, partners. And finally, we also asked questions to help us examine whether these programs are capable of accounting or designed to account for ongoing environmental change, so climate change and other forms of land use change. So to accomplish these objectives, we started by identifying habitat credited programs by searching the literature and consulting relevant websites. Uh, so essentially synthesizing all available information on these programs. We then use those sources to identify ecological and institutional attributes of each program. Finally, to assess goals, outcomes, strengths, and shortcomings of these programs and this approach, we surveyed individuals that had been directly engaged in these programs, so either the development of these programs or the way that they were operationalized on the ground. So we asked a series of questions in an online survey, uh, an in-depth sort of expert survey, to inquire about, for example, the type and frequency of data collection, also the duration of program enrollment, so whether there was preferences for uh, 
these programs to involve agreements that were in perpetuity or over a shorter time frame. We also asked economic questions about the cost structure for credit. And also we posed questions to address institutional incentives and barriers. Okay, so I'd like to talk about our results now. First, on this slide, I'm showing you a list of the programs that we have identified and across the United States that meet our criteria as Habitat crediting programs. Uh, these, include, uh, these include programs that focus on focal species that are threatened or endangered in some cases, so federally listed species. In other cases, are candidate species for, uh, for under the ESA, and in other cases are considered species of concern and are uh, under consideration, such as, say, the monarch butterfly. You'll notice that all of these species are terrestrial animals. And then the other thing that I would like to point out is that some of these programs were developed and also have, there are agreements in place and so are, are operating actively. And others are programs that were developed, but there has not yet been any active exchange of credit. Okay, so I'd like to start by highlighting some kind of key high-level findings from our survey. So first of all of the respondents, so again, these are experts that had been actively engaged in these programs. They all felt, and uh, I should just mention that, uh, that um, about 40% of our respondents were associated with DOD, 40% with other federal agencies, and the other 20% with nonprofit organizations that often serve as boundary organizations engaged in developing and implementing these programs. So 100% of all of our respondents reported that they felt that these programs had the potential or had enhanced military readiness. Most respondents also felt that investment in these programs yielded positive returns both for DOD and for their partners. Respondents also overwhelmingly felt that ecological goals of these programs were clearly defined However, only about half of the respondents felt that they were likely to be met. So there appears to be some challenges there. And also only approximately half of the respondents felt that these programs were designed to effectively respond to environmental change or a dynamic environment. So I'm now going to talk through a series of figures that illustrate some of our other findings uh, from both an ecological, economic, and institutional perspective. So I want to start here by reporting on program goals. So most respondents uh, reported that program goals were primarily focused on habitat quality and habitat amount, so increasing the amount and quality of habitat for these target species. To a slightly lesser extent, they also felt that program goals were focused on changing the status of the species, so that could be delisting downlisting or avoided listing of the species under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and then also many of these programs prioritize abundance to a lesser extent uh, where was a focus on uh, increasing the range or distribution of the species across the landscape. Okay, now I wanna talk a bit about monitoring. So again, we were interested in the degree to which these program goals were assessed. And um, what we find is that monitoring is relatively limited in scope and in frequency. So again, you'll see the percentage of all respondents on the y-axis and along the x-axis is the very, various metrics uh, that have been used to assess success, uh, ecological, success of ecological goals. And what you'll see is that uh, in the black bars, these are metrics that were measured annually in the medium gray bars every few years, and then other usually means less frequently. So most often, uh, habitat amount was uh, used as a metric of success, and then uh, to a slightly lesser extent, species occurrence or habitat quality or the density or abundance of species. Only in a minority of cases, so relatively infrequently, was some demographic parameters like reproduction success, and uh, survivor, survivorship incorporated into these monitoring schemes. 
Okay, I'd like to talk a bit about the economic viability of these HEPTAC crediting programs as perceived by our respondents. And uh, you'll see that there's mis uh, some mixed uh, perceptions here. So to start sort of on the left-hand side of the figure, the majority of respondents did agree that it was good business to sell credits. Uh, uh, the majority of all respondents agreed with that, or at least did not agree, disagree with that statement. They also, most respondents also felt that regular business, either of DOD uh, or other organizations, and their partners were not impacted by participation in these programs. However, moving to the right-hand side of the graph, you'll see that the majority of respondents did feel as if upfront costs uh, were a barrier. So there may be some barriers to entry here uh, in regard to, to those costs. Okay. And then finally, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the institutional um, challenges and uh, benefits of engaging in these programs. So the biggest benefit identified by uh, participants was that it provided uh, flexibility for offsite mitigation for DOD and other organizations. So that's really important. The majority of respondents did feel like that was an asset of this approach to cross-boundary conservation. However, again, on the right-hand side of the figure, you'll see that there were some challenges in terms of, say, again, some of the opportunity costs to being engaged. Most folks felt as if consultation, for example, uh, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services was not sufficiently rapid uh, in order to move these programs uh, forward. And there was also not always sufficient funding to really assess uh, credit needs. And to some degree also, uh, there was some limitation in terms of willing landowners in order to, uh, in order to provide those, those credits. Okay, so I'd like to now uh, summarize some of our key findings. Uh, so some of the strengths that emerged from our survey, our synthesis of the literature, and also, our, uh, we visited several installations on the ground who had thought about or had engaged in habitat crediting programs. And some of the strengths of habitat crediting programs that emerged uh, from this limited scope project is that they appear to enhance military readiness. They also appear to be a positive investment for DOD and partners. And program goals are also a well or consistently defined. Some important shortcomings include that upfront costs uh, could limit engagement in these programs on both sides for DOD and partners. There was also some disagreement uh, in terms of how respondents felt that credit purchasers and providers would feel about agreements being either in perpetuity or short-term agreements. So agreements are off, can be 10 or 25 years or in theory, you know, in perpetuity. And I'm happy to talk more about what some reasons might be for that. What are some advantages and disadvantages to agreement length uh, during the question answer period, if that's of interest. And then finally, we find uh, that monitoring is probably insufficient to fully evaluate ecological outcomes uh, for these species and that there perhaps should be a stronger focus on demographic uh, parameters. Okay, I'd like to talk now about some benefits uh, to the Department of Defense that we feel has emerged from, from this limited scope project. First of all, uh, program uh, installation biologists and managers and also natural resource uh, professionals leadership in DOD may wonder whether habitat crediting programs are a good investment. And uh, what we find, again, from our sort of integrated analysis of the literature, our survey, and our site visits is that they can provide regulatory relief, but they are certainly not effective or appropriate in all contexts. So we would like to suggest, uh, again, based on this information that we have synthesized, that habitat creditings are probably most likely to be viable or most appropriate in the following context. So first, in situations where on-site mitigation, so on-site conservation activities, for example, are simply incompatible with installation goals of military readiness. And so it becomes really necessary to consider 
off-site mitigation or off-site partnerships. That's not true for many installations that are, that are able to maintain uh, really large and viable populations of species of concern on installations. But for others, that flexibility of engaging in off-site mitigation can be really valuable. We also find that in installations where future activities or future use may be somewhat dynamic and uncertain, that these programs may be promising. So this hedges against the uncertainty of perhaps needing to use a portion of the installation that's currently providing habitat for rare species in the future for some other use. Engaging in habitat crediting programs um, can provide some flexibility uh, to use installations in different ways moving forward. We also find that installations that are in a mosaic of rural or undeveloped lands are probably mo more likely to be successful engaging in habitat crediting programs with neighbors, simply because those neighbors are more likely to have the habitat or the potential to have the habitat to, um, to support those, those target species. And finally, it's quite important that the, that the habitat requirements of those target species are well known, are clearly defined, and also are compatible uh, potentially with working land. So that just broadens the scope of the type of landowners that DOD and others could, could partner with to restore and sustain habitat for these species. And again, that uh, just to reiterate the point of understanding the habitat requirements, it's also important that the habitat requirements are understood, but they're also, it's also feasible to restore or protect that habitat uh, offsite. So um, I, uh, put a picture here of the red cockaded woodpecker in the southeastern pineland as an example of a bird that requires habitat that, you know, it's simply not trivial uh, to create or restore this habitat over a short period of time because these birds require, in many cases, forests that are decades old uh, to create the cavities that are suitable for nesting. Okay, so I'd like to talk just briefly uh, about next steps. So what else might DOD need to know to make informed decisions on whether or not to engage in habitat crediting programs? First of all, we do feel like there's improved monitoring is necessary to truly understand the ecological outcomes of the programs that have occurred uh, to date. We also feel as if there should be an increased focus on multiple species, which could help reduce transaction costs. So reduce the upfront costs uh, economic and institutional of developing these plans. So there are many uh, landscapes in which DOD is active and, and other organizations are active that have conservation priorities for which there's multiple species of conservation concern. And we feel like there's potential to explore habitat crediting programs or other types of cross-boundary conservation efforts that could focus on multiple species rather than one species at a time. And finally, we feel as if there is a need to create a decision support tool for the full suite of tools uh, that are within the sort of bucket of cross-boundary conservation. So as I noted earlier, it not, in not all situations will habitat crediting programs be appropriate or be successful. Other tools may be uh, equally or more successful in these landscapes, such as conservation easements or translocation cooperatives, uh, or fee simple purchases in some cases. And I'm, again, I'm happy to talk more about those, those suite of tools uh, during the question and answer uh, section if that's something that is of interest. All right, I'd like to go ahead and finish by uh, encouraging you to, uh, to refer to this website that provides some more information about our project. And also please do feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is here on this slide. If you have any questions about our project or about this topic, I'd really be delighted to speak with you further about this. And um, I'd like to note that we have two papers that are in, in under, undergoing peer review right now that will be also reporting the results of this project. And I hope to share those uh, as, soon as, as soon as they are available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liba, for a fantastic presentation. Um, what, uh, Laura, if we could please go back to the previous slide. There is a question from the Air Force uh, to Liba about the availability of her final report and when it will be posted to the website. Liba, can you please provide a time frame 
Um, sure. Yeah, so I actually I'm surprised to hear that the final report um, is not posted to the website, so I can communicate with uh, CERTIF about that. We did finalize the report last January um, and submitted it to CERTIF, so I can follow up about that, but I'm also to share, happy to share it directly with anyone that's interested. Great, thank you so much. And as a reminder, uh, Liba has graciously agreed to, to receive emails and phone calls at the email address and phone number shown on this slide. So thank you for that, Liba. Um, the next question is from the Southwest Research Institute, uh, and it goes along these lines. Can you please provide an example of how habitat crediting programs enhance military residence, uh, readiness, since many of the respondents in your survey felt it did so? Sure. So I think that the uh, primary way in which habitat crediting programs have the uh, capacity or the ability to enhance military readiness is to provide that increased uh, flexibility to engage in necessary trainings or to build infrastructure, for example, for those trainings on site. So, for example, uh, we spoke directly with a biologist and manager at, um, at uh, several sites in the south and the some installations in the southeast, and they felt like it was very valuable to have the ability uh, to, uh, to provide payments to partners in their buffer areas uh, to restore and protect a gopher tortoise habitat, for example, which would then, uh, because they didn't have enough flexibility on installation uh, to sustain the number of gopher tortoises that, was, that were necessary to meet their obligations under their uh, under agreements with the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service often is uh, instrumental in providing guidelines and collaboration with DOD about the number of individuals that should ideally be maintained on site. And so having that flexibility to then have those uh, individuals of that target species, that habitat be restored and those populations increased off site, then allows DOD to go ahead and move forward with important training activities that might not, not otherwise be possible because of that, those regulatory requirements. Uh, I hope that answers your question, but I'm happy to, to follow up. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have um, a question from the Central Florida Regional Planning Council, uh, and uh, it goes as follows. Did any programs stand out in terms of ability to replicate or firmly establish protocols for implementation? Yes, that is a very good question. And that, that's one of the reasons we're really interested in trying to synthesize information on this topic is that there is no sort of unified set of recommendations uh, for how to proceed if you are interested in engaging in a habitat uh, crediting program. So uh, I would say that the programs that have where there's the most documentation uh, and are are arguably are the most thorough in terms of the information that they've provided uh, is the gopher tortoise uh, program in the southeast and also the um, the uh, Fort Hood uh, program in in Texas which is no longer in operation but they had a, at least a three-year pilot period so there's the most documentation that I'm aware of related to those two programs uh, but I'm also happy to send, if you want to reach out to me directly, I can send some documentation related to those programs and several others as well, including those where DOD is, is not a partner, in case that's helpful. Thank you, Liva. Um, could a private landowner pursue a partnership with the DOD directly to establish a habitat crediting uh, program? Or would the landowner need to go through an established uh, organization? Yeah, so uh, my understanding is that um, is that DOD could partner uh, with private landowners um, directly. However, there also needs to be consultation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it seems as if in most cases to date, 
There has also been active engagement with either a state agency, a state wildlife agency, or a nonprofit organization, such as Environmental Defense Fund, which has been active in several of these projects to help kind of negotiate uh, what, it, what a credit means in this context. Um, and so I don't know of any examples where those other organizations have not been engaged in the development of a habitat crediting program, but private landowners are frequently uh, the organizations or the, the entities that are providing those that are doing the habitat restoration work uh, on site in close partnership with DOD. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is from NASAC Northwest. If these programs do last in uh, perpetuity or for a very long time period, how can the DOD keep track of the programs and associated credits? Is there a region-wide or nationwide database? Yes, great question. Um, I think that if you, the, these programs are usually regional in nature because many of the species of conservation concern are regional in terms of their habitat requirements and their range. Uh, so these, I think these programs are usually regional in nature. I would say that uh, to just address the question of in perpetuity um, briefly, there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, DOD installations and uh, biologist managers that we spoke with are actively interested in the in perpetuity agreements over the short term agreements um, because they feel like it's a better investment uh, than opening up the possibility that, say, within 10 or 20 years, those investments could be lost as, say, landowners change priorities for, ha for how they use their land. So I do think that there are strengths to considering. Uh, agreements that are in perpetuity, even if it does come with that perhaps added burden of tracking these investments and monitoring the outcomes of these investments over time. Wonderful, Viva. Thank you so much. This next question is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. Uh, can you provide additional reasons or barriers to, to satisfying timely consultation needs? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, and I would just say that, um, you know, that our, the respondents highlighted this, flagged this as an issue. Uh, and uh, my sense is that it's for private loan donors and also for DOD, in many cases, time, you know, time is valuable. Um, and so time is as valuable as money in these situations. And so if there are ways to uh, accelerate the consultation process, uh, that, that I think would reduce barriers to entry for private landowners and also for DOD. So uh, I did have the chance to speak with the DOD Conservation Committee uh, last year or several years ago. And that, this was also a concern that was highlighted in that room is that developing these plans uh, and working with Fish and Wildlife Service, although they had really productive relationships with Fish and Wildlife Service, often took an extended period of time. And that's one of the reasons why I've suggested that we're suggesting that a multi-species approach could perhaps um, reduce some of those barriers and reduce some of that time. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, maybe one last question before we transition to Mark. Uh, did any of the programs reviewed work as a crediting program with an ecosystem approach as opposed to a species by species approach? And if not, what are your thoughts on the value of this approach? Yes, terrific. Uh, no, so all of these programs were focused on a particular target species. Uh, however, you know, in practice, I think many of many biologists and managers on the ground are managing from an ecosystem or a community level perspective. So they're interested in managing for multiple species, uh, but these programs are really focused about around individual species in part because uh, that's often how uh, the, the, that's how the Endangered Species Act is set up is it's focused for the most part, there are some exceptions, but especially when it comes to terrestrial animals, really focused on the recovery of individual species. 
Um, and so that's also the, the focus of these plans. I do think there is tremendous potential to be thinking more broadly about communities and ecosystems. And sort of, and I, you know, DOD is doing that, for example, through their Sentinel Landscapes program, is thinking about conservation challenges that transcend individual species and also boundaries. So I think programs like that have a lot of promise. Thank you so much, Liba, for doing a terrific job of all these questions. We have a number that have come in that we have not been able to uh, relate to you, so we'll save them uh, until the final Q&A session. But at this point, I'd like to go ahead and transition to our second speaker, Dr. Mark Davis, who is a conservation biologist and Director of the Collaborative Ecological Genetics Laboratory at the Illinois Natural History Survey Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Mark's research focuses on leveraging genetic data to inform the management of rare, threatened, and endangered species. Specifically, his work involves the use of E, or in environmental DNA, to rapidly assay biodiversity in numerous contexts. He is actively partnering with project managers at military installations to mobilize eDNA monitoring uh, for at-risk species. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees in zoology from North uh, Dakota State University, a master's degree in ecology from Colorado State University, and a doctoral degree in natural resources and environmental sciences from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Mark, please proceed. Thank you, Rula, for that kind introduction. Thanks to CERTIF and ESTCP for allowing me to participate in this webinar series. I'm thrilled to be here with you all today, and uh, thanks to all of you out there in the Ethernet who attended. Uh, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize my collaborators on this project, so uh, please recognize uh, Dr. Brenda Milano-Flores here at the Illinois Natural History Survey, Dr. Lindsay Harper at Liverpool John Moores University, and Professor Matt Niemiller and Joe Benito at the University of Alabama Huntsville. So as Rula mentioned, I'm a conservation biologist that uses genetics to understand rare, threatened, or endangered species, and I'm really keenly interested in things that are driving the endangerment process, but you know, to get at that, we really got to know where these critters occur on the landscape, and, and to do that, we can then effectively inform adaptive management strategies. So today I'll be talking about some of the work that we've done documenting pollinator communities using environmental DNA. In the past decade, eDNA has risen as an increasingly viable means of measuring monitoring biodiversity. And as Rula mentioned in my introduction, my lab's been, been leveraging eDNA in a number of different capacities uh, to try and document where threatened, endangered, and rare species are. And uh, kind of at the, at the leading edge of that is using it for pollinator species, and we'll be focusing on that today. So a roadmap of where we're going to go is uh, the need for rapidly assessing pollinator communities. I'll talk about that in the next slides. I'll then outline the microfluidic metabarcoding of environmental DNA, eDNA approach that we used here uh, and detail a number of the methodological comparisons that we made in, in, with the goal of trying to develop an optimized workflow. Uh, I'll talk about, obviously, whether or not that actually worked. Uh, is there any efficacy here? Uh, are there any drawbacks? Uh, where might it be most viable? And finally, I'll put it into this broader context of applicability on DOD lands. And at the end of the day, what I hope is you'll see the promise of eDNA, as well as the opportunities for applications in your areas. So in the last decade, I'm sure we've all heard a lot of, uh, a lot of noise about insects declining at an alarming rate. And you know, estimates suggest that about 41% of arthropod species have severely declined in the past decade, with 40% of our over 30 million global insect species either threatened with extinction or endangered. And of those that remain, concerningly, the IUCN notes that millions of species are data deficient, meaning that reasonable assessments of their status are impossible and these decline numbers are probably an underestimate of what's actually going on uh, on the ground. It's led to a lot of publicity. I'm sure many of you saw the article in the New York Times last year, the insect apocalypse is here. Now, that hasn't been without debate. It's a controversial issue. Nevertheless, it's clear that insects are among our most imperiled taxonomic groups. And among those imperiled in, uh, insects, pollinators seem to be particularly impacted. 
In the U.S., uh, beekeepers report annual loss of colonies at around 30 percent of the last 10 years, but some years approaching nearly 43 percent losses. Other pollinators like butterflies, beetles, flies, though generally more poorly studied and, and less understood than pollinators, are also showing similar patterns. You know, ultimately, we have mounting evidence suggesting that global pollinator declines are occurring, and these have catastrophic consequences. Pollinators provide critical ecoservices. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, these are the things that nature provides that we as humans rely upon to nature. Through pollinator services alone, pollinators contribute uh, more than 40, $24 billion to the U.S. economy. Now, I grew up in Northwest Iowa. I now live in Central Illinois, so most of my life has been set in the Midwest Corn Belt. And I can assure you that without pollinators, the regional economy, economy would collapse. So they're critical uh, to, to both function of ecosystems, but also to our global economy. So when you couple the economic benefits of pollinators with their crashing populations, we quickly see the need for conservation action. And while the monarch butterfly and the rusty patched bumblebee here in North America are perhaps the most publicized examples, Numerous pollinator species are under review for potential listing under the Endangered Species Act. So it seems inevitable that there will be many, many more pollinator species listed, uh, which have pretty profound impacts across a number of areas. So typically, uh, when we want to try and find uh, the communities of pollinators that exist in a given place, we use a conventional approach that is effective. So what does that look like? How do we go about measure, measuring and monitoring pollinator communities? Typically, what we do is send a team out in the field with clipboards, data sheets, pencils, and stopwatches. For a period of time, they'd observe and document flowers and the insects that are visiting them. So you take that over enough time and space, you get a reliable estimate of the pollinator community. But this isn't as easy as it sounds. Uh, species have different life histories, different phenologies, different behaviors and activity patterns. As the number of TNE species at a given location increases, the amount of effort increases. So it becomes incredibly costly, both in terms of time and, and money, to document communities accurately. And this problem is exacerbated by what's been come to be known as the taxonomic impediment. You know, what this simply means is that we're losing the expertise needed to accurately identify individuals down to the species level, leaving very few experts that can identify these species. And of course, with that expertise and the lack thereof, those that are uh, out there to do this sort of work become increasingly expensive to the supply and demand. So what does this mean for DOD installations? Quite simply, more species being listed places more pressures on DOD installations to measure, monitor, and manage these species. And these activities obviously have direct operational impacts by increasing range closure times to have people out in the field monitoring these flowers which ultimately decreases lethality and mission readiness. If you can't have troops on the ground uh, training, you can't, uh, you can't be as effective as we want to be. It also spreads already depleted conservation resources, time and money even more thin, leaving us to do more with less. So our task then is to maximize return on conservation investment when it comes to measuring and monitoring T and E pollinator species. So our proposition for our limited scope CERTA project uh, that we conducted last year is that microfluidic metabarcoding of environmental DNA may provide an, an effective alternative to conventional sampling. We predict that it can be faster, cheaper, better remote locations, and as effective in documenting those communities, particularly with an emphasis on T and E species. So a little background for the uninitiated, environmental DNA or eDNA is trace DNA deposited in the environment through shedding of cells, feces, etc. This eDNA accumulates over time, and it can be harnessed using forensic-like techniques and ultimately leverage to document species occurrences. Microfluidic metabarcoding, on the other hand, is a, an emerging technology uh, that allows us to simultaneously generate sequence data from eDNA or other sources across a number of genetic regions or primer or from primer pairs. Don't want to get too far in the weeds, but the bottom line is that our different regions of the primers we use to generate the data have biases. And so they may not amplify all the tax you're interested in. So the ability to use multiple uh, primer sets to look at multiple regions simultaneously could allow us an ability to compensate and cast a much broader net to detect the, the whole community uh, with uh, a de-emphasis on the biases that may be inherent. So how did we do this? Well, we had a number of objectives. And first, we wanted to evaluate existing metabarcoding primers. So these are really what we use to generate the data. And we used in silico and in vitro approaches 
to get an idea where those blind spots might be uh, and to ultimately put together an optimized panel of primer sets to try and capture the broadest pollinator diversity. Then we wanted to assess the efficacy of eDNA to detect pollinator species. We used uh, both a greenhouse and field approach to decide, does this work? Um, I'll give you a spoiler right off the hopper. Two months before we initiated our project, a paper was published by some researchers in Europe that showed that using a different approach that yes, from flowers you can uh, document pollinator communities. And while it stung that we got beat, uh, beaten to the punch, uh, we did have a number of differences with our study that we'll talk about today specifically using the microfluidic approach, but also we wanted to, to, to understand if we could optimize workflow. So what are the best combinations of techniques to maximize the capturing of these communities? So how did we do this? Well, first we established a flowering plant community in a greenhouse here on the University of Illinois campus. We introduced the common Eastern bumblebee into that uh, greenhouse and we watched them. And so what we did was we did a phased introduction of three uh, focal flower species. We use penstemon, monarda, and solanum. We'll talk about this later, but ultimately we wanted to look at flowers with different morphologies, perhaps different handling times, and other different characteristics. So after those flowers were brought into the lab, we released the bees, gave them some time to, uh, to acclimate, and then we did two things. We sat in the greenhouse, we watched bees attend the flowers, and then we sampled those flowers. And 24 hours later, without any observation, we go in and select random flowers that, that we could not show had any bees associated with them. And then we applied them to our microfluidic metabarcoding approach. Our field study was very similar. We had the good fortune of having those same three focal flower species on the University of Illinois campus. We went out, we sat by those flower beds, we used a bit of a conventional approach. We watched the flowers to see which pollinators were visiting them. We sampled those flowers, uh, and then again, 24 hours later, without any observation, we came back and took random flowers. You know, to get an idea, do we detect bees where we know they occurred, and do we detect pollinators where we know they we don't necessarily know they occurred? So going in blind. And again, since I, I spoiled the punchline already, the results show that yes, absolutely, microfluidic metabarcoding and eDNA does allow us to detect pollinator species under con controlled uh, conditions. Indeed, we did detect our common eastern bumblebee, which we saw and observed on these flowers. But in addition, uh, we were given a list uh, from the greenhouse staff of uh, invertebrate species that were known to occur in those greenhouses, and we detected them too. So while we didn't observe them directly, we were able to detect things like western flower thrips, which were extremely common, uh, silverleaf whitefly, cotton aphids, yellow garden spiders. And so things that were thought to occur but weren't directly observed were documented using this approach as well. Again, giving us these first insights into can we develop a complete picture of the pollinator community in these locations. Should come as no surprise that in the field we found similar results. We detected a number of pollinator species depicted here on this uh, slide, most of which we didn't directly observe. And so pulling from those flowers, that residual DNA that was left on the flowers themselves was sufficient to capture the pollinator community that was visiting these flower beds. And we also detected things that we wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, you know, we weren't out at night, so we didn't, uh, we didn't visually observe any of the white line sphinx moths out there, but sure enough, they showed up. We also appear to have dragonflies that rested on these flowers. And so we we're able to cobble together a really, uh, a really good picture of what sorts of arthropod species were visiting these flowers uh, in these flower beds. So very happy with these results. But I will note, it wasn't perfect. And I'll point to the curious case of the carpenter bee. Here we have it depicted on this slide. Uh, in 2019, during our, our study period, um, there was a remarkable abundance of these species in the flower beds on campus. And in fact, for our penstemon flowers, just about every flower showed evidence of nectar robbing. So these bees would come in, they'd bore a hole into the side of the flower and they'd remove nectar from the flower and then off they'd go. They were ubiquitous in these flower beds, so high density, a lot of biomass, lots of impact on the flowers. And yet, we did not detect carpenter bees in any of our field samples. And so our first thing to think about as we're looking about deploying this is that detection probability is imperfect, and it can stem from a number of different factors that I'll talk about later. Uh, but be aware, this isn't a perfect approach, and, and we have to think about these sorts of things as we proceed. As I mentioned, we did a number of methodological comparisons that I'll try and burn through fairly quickly here. You know, we wanted to compare the different flower types. Our thinking here is that different flowers with different morphologies may yield differential uh, communities. And indeed, that happened. 
Pensamen yielded numerically greater communities, while Menarda also had a diverse community. So different flowers revealed different communities. A lot of factors could be at play uh, in these results. For example, our solanum flowers were quite small, and so we'd observe the bees just barely hanging on uh, with very low contact and low handling time. The pensamen, on the other hand, the bees would crawl in, root around, spend a great deal of time handling the flower, likely depositing far more DNA. And so it becomes quickly clear that, you know, the types of flowers can have pretty big impacts on whether or not you're detecting the full communities. We varied our sampling methodologies as well. So we looked at three different ways of sampling, harvesting the whole flower, placing it in a buffer, swabbing the flowers, uh, or pulling nectar draws using capillary tubes. And what we see is that you know, whole flower performed really, really well. So in those, so where we have opportunity to sample whole flowers, it's going to give us a good depiction of the community. Swabbing worked really well uh, as well, uh, which I found interesting and I think is important for thinking about if we want to deploy the sampling in remote areas. There's much less volume of materials you need to bring out in the field with you. Uh, and so perhaps it's a, it's a great method where you need to be very agile in your sampling. And finally, nectar performed poorly, but I will note that we had low sample sizes here, in part just uh, nectar robbing and low yields. Uh, but preliminarily, it seems that, that nectar just doesn't perform nearly as well. We also used a, a two different uh, preservation and extraction methods that were paired. Uh, the first being the commercially available chiagen. Uh, so we used their ATL buffer to preserve the whole flowers, the swabs, the nectar. Uh, and then we extracted using their, their protocols. Uh, we also used more of a, a sort of a standard eDNA preparation where we preserve the samples in CTAB and then use the phenol chloroform isoamyl extraction. Chiagen's uh, pretty expensive, pretty proprietary. CTAB's much cheaper. Um, both seem to be pretty effective, though chiagen performed uh, a little bit better. Has some additional advantages in that you're not dealing with such hazardous chemicals like phenol, chloroform, isoamyl, alcohol. So there are some benefits to the ATL chiagen approach, but I'll note there are a number of different ways to extract DNA from these environmental samples. And further testing of these additional methods, particularly uh, online homebrew kits, uh, will potentially identify better methods as we move forward. As I mentioned, the microfluidic approach allows us to generate data across a number of different loci and regions simultaneously. We looked at two mitochondrial regions, CO1 and 16S, uh, and CO1 provided better communities. This could simply be because of better representation in online database that the pipelines access. Nevertheless, it performed better. See a little bit of variance between the primer sets. CO1 appears to be uh, pretty effective. This may also hold true for vertebrate pollinator, uh, vertebrate pollinators, but what I will note is that as we look across all these different sets, the communities that they reveal are different. And so we see that the different primer sets are able to compensate for biases among the other primer sets which you can't do if you take just a single locus conventional metabarcoding approach. And again, bioinformatics pipelines showed some differences. Anacapa revealed a larger, uh, more diverse community, while MetaBeat had lower variance. As more online uh, or more uh, bioinformatics pipelines come online, it would be wise for us to continue to evaluate those and compare and contrast. So ultimately, our approach revealed that pollinator communities uh, in both controlled and uncontrolled conditions could be revealed using environmental DNA and microfluidic metabarcoding. We detected both observed and unobserved species effectively, though again noting that some species that we did observe weren't detected. And we proposed a comprehensive workflow to maximize communities revealed and minimize false negatives. We recognize that many factors influence pollinator communities, biotic, abiotic, and technical. And so as you engage in this sort of approach, every step of the way you need to be thinking about the decisions that you make in what, how you're gonna design your study to document these pollinator communities. We've got a workflow that's here, um, you know, that thinks about flower morphology. Ultimately, our recommendation is to be effective, you need to sample a variety of different flower morphologies. Like I said, for sampling, whole flower seems best, but swabbing will work great. Uh, the ATL and modified chiagen approach was most effective, but there may be others that, that will work better. C1 provides a diverse community, and uh, our metabarcoding bioinformatics pipelines in Anacapa seem to perform slightly better, but they both did a great job of documenting these communities. In terms of benefit to DOD, uh, I think one of the most important things is that sampling for EDN is much, much quicker than conventional sampling. What this means is a reduction in range closure time, which hopefully we confer to increases in lethality and mission readiness. 
In addition, the technological advances to be able to leverage these online repositories and bioinformatics pipelines means decreased reliance on this dwindling taxonomic expertise. Cost efficiency is really important. Reduce field time equals savings. Now, the uh, approach on the back end for generating the data is a little bit more expensive, but it seems to be well offset uh, by the reduction in field time and the number of personnel it takes to do the field work. Finally, there's a lot of flexibility here. You can do not only the eDNA metabarcoding for your pollinator communities, but if you harvest those pollinators themselves, uh, you can look at the pollen that they're carrying. And get an idea of the networks of both pollinators uh, and the flowers that they're visiting in your ecological community, which gives you a great deal more power to manage these systems. We feel there's broad applicability on DOD installations. Uh, our preliminary, uh, we, we think the preliminary RTE screenings using this approach can then lead to strategically targeted surveys. So using eDNA as a first pass across a broad swath of your installation. And then where you get detections, you can then uh, target your conventional sampling for those TNE species that are afforded protections on the Endangered Species Act. We think there's opportunities beyond arthropods. Uh, certainly there are mammalian and, and avian uh, pollinators that these sorts of approaches could be leveraged, again, for a quick pass through these areas to determine which pollinator communities you have. And finally, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it gives us the opportunity to elucidate plant pollinator networks. So it takes us to that next level of understanding, not only of what the communities are, but how they're interacting and how changes can lead to cascades in our ecosystems. We had a lot of folks that helped out on this project and I acknowledge them here. And with that, uh, I hope that we can discuss and, and I can answer some of your questions. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And if we can go to the next slide, this is where Mark's contract information is available. And uh, Mark, can you um, let us know if your final report is posted uh, to this website yet, or if not, when you expect it to be available? We're in the same boat as Leva. Uh, our report was approved a couple of weeks ago, and it has been resubmitted. I assume it'll be posted soon. But unfortunately, I can't tell you when. Great. Thank you so much. If you don't mind sharing copies of that report uh, with anyone who approaches you about that, we would very much appreciate it. Um, we Absolutely. have a number of questions for you. Great. Great. Thank you. We have a number of questions for you. The first one is from a retired U.S. Army colonel uh, who worked in the um, environmental management area for DOD for a long time. And his question is as follows, what work is being done to identify capstone insect species essential to the maintenance and recovery of threatened and endangered species? That is a great and complicated question. Um, and you know, I, I don't have clarification, but in terms of eDNA, very little. Um, you know, eDNA is about 10 years old, and it's only recently being leveraged in pollinators. To my knowledge, this is only the second study that's looked at pollinator species in any way, uh, let alone focusing in on those keystone pollinator species. You know, it's our hope that this work is going to springboard a great deal more work in that arena, again, combining with work on those host flower species. Um, you know, there's a wealth of, of, of conventional sampling for those sorts of species to document pollinator communities. Um, but as far as eDNA is concerned, it's limited at best. And, you know, we're hoping that that changes in the next five years. Thank you so much. This next question is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. Can eDNA work be calibrated or enhanced to help with collecting abundance, status, or trend date data, not just presence or richness uh, metrics? Great question. And this is, in my opinion, sort of the, uh, the, the grand challenge of eDNA work. And so to date, the results have been all over the place as to whether eDNA can be effective in estimating abundance in addition to simple occupancy. And the reason why it's been so equivocal is that there are so many factors that go into uh, eDNA, its persistence, its, its transport, and its fate in natural systems. There are so many biotic and abiotic factors at play. 
that it can be very, very difficult to pin down. Um, in fact, there are times when you have known occurrences of, of species in high densities and you get false, uh, false negatives at those sites because of those characteristics. So, you know, one of the more famous examples is that you think about aquatic systems with, with flowing water, right? You have species, say a mussel on the, on the floor and they are shedding DNA through feces, through gametes, et cetera. And when that happens is impacted by the species behavior in biology. And so you might have pulses of reproduction in May, and that's a great time to sample. That also coincides with blood pulses, which can dilute DNA. And so all of these factors have to be considered when you are looking at something like copy number, in the case of metabarcoding, read number, in ascertaining abundance. So to summarize, I guess, as ineloquently as possible, we're not there yet, but there's an amazing amount of work going on in that arena right now. Uh, and you know, that's one of the things that uh, my lab talks about is, you know, this unified theory of eDNA sampling that will allow for that. You know, there have been cases where copy numbers has, has tracked really nicely with abundance, and there's other cases where it hasn't. So I'll say, to, to wrap up the question, it depends. And a ton of work is being done to crack that nut. And, and we're actively engaged in that in my lab and in many others across the world. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, the next question is from NASLAC Northwest. What would be done with this data once you know the pollinator species make up at a base? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I envision that what can be done with these data is a number of things. You know, obviously installations are required to steward their natural resources. And so as the number of pollinator species are being listed under the ESA, and as other uh, arthropod species are being listed, uh, these data will help inform where on the installation these organisms occur. And then that allows for the installations to make informed decisions as they manage uh, their, their land, right, their holdings. So what activities can we engage in? Do we need to, to, to make mitigation steps? What are those steps and, and what do they need to be? And so there's a lot of work uh, going on right now. I, I will say, you know, it is wonderful to be involved in the CERTIP and ESTCP program because many years ago they embraced eDNA as a viable means of, of measuring and monitoring biodiversity on installations. And so they're very far ahead in this game. So online repositories where scientists like me uh, can upload these data uh, for other researchers and installation managers to access uh, at a moment's notice to look at what the communities look like and where they might need to channel their resources is becoming available. Uh, that can also be leveraged by other scientists who want to take those data and look at large scale trends in patterns and processes of pollinator communities. And so I feel there's a wealth of value that can be mined from having these data available, not only to the installations themselves, but to the broader scientific community. And so that's what we're engaged in doing right now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is a question from Rice University. Could this approach that you described be used for bat pollinated plants in which pollination observation at night is often challenging? Yes, absolutely. And if any funders out there uh, want to work with me on that, we are actively looking for a proof of concept study to do this in the desert southwest. This worked really, really well for uh, our arthropod pollinators here in this project. And eDNA has shown great potential in, in many, many other contexts. And it hasn't been tried for bat pollinators in the Southwest. We are actively engaged in, in putting out proposals to do just that. We're hopeful that in the next 18 months, we'll start our first study to validate whether or not we can detect those species. Because you're absolutely right. Uh, bats are particularly difficult in the Southwest to sample and, and to observe. And, you know, we think that this might be a fast, easy way to go about sampling for those things, you know. You can wake up in the morning, uh, you can head out in the field, you can harvest those flowers and, and extract the DNA and get an idea of, of what pollinators, and not just the bats. This is the beauty of the uh, microfluidic microfluid, approach, is that we can include on the same panel arthropod, uh, bat, reptile, uh, bird, primer sets, and multiples, so we can capture the full vertebrate and invertebrate communities, or at least as the results here show, there's the potential that we can do that. And so we're, we're hoping that can be done. I think you're spot on. I think bats are a great candidate and we're looking forward to, to trying it out here soon. Great, 
Great, thank you. And this next question is from Igor. Uh, what is your best guess for why the car printer B was not detected? Uh, were the primers probes shown to be specific for this species? Uh, in silico, or did you try to amplify from tissue sample DNA? Yeah, great question. Uh, a, a lot of bourbon has been consumed since we finished this project by me trying to think through this. Um, I will say, so it, for time's sake, I didn't include it, but we included a lot of positive controls. And the in silico testing did show that many of our primer sets should amplify this species. And in addition, we included uh, tissue samples as positive controls in our plates. And indeed, our positive controls with our primer sets did hit. So we know it's not the methodological approach. There is something ecologically or biologically go go that's going on. And I'm not 100% sure what it is. My speculation is that as these carpenter bees are on the sides of these flowers, there's limited contact area uh, with their tissues, number one that when they're cutting into uh, the sides of the flowers, they're not depositing DNA. Uh, you know, there, there aren't scales or hairs being lost. Uh, they're not putting down sufficient saliva. Um, you know, it's, there's just very, very low amounts of DNA. And then when they're, they're drinking the nectar, they're also not losing a lot of DNA through that system. So my hypothesis is that it's just very low DNA deposition. Um, but the reality is, is we don't know. Um, it, it seems clear that it's not something methodological. It's something that's going on um, at the flower with the bees themselves. So I'm not sure uh, if anybody out there listening has any thoughts on this, would love to chat further about it because it's been driving me nuts. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question is from the University of Notre Dame. Could the length of flower bloom time have an impact on how much eDNA accumulates, or would you expect degradation to occur too quickly for that to matter? Uh, in the immortal words of Homer J. Simpson, a little from column A, a little from column B. Uh, it's both, right? So as I mentioned to a previous question, there are a number of factors that have been shown to influence eDNA persistence. That includes UV radiation, and these flowers are designed to get that UV radiation. And so you've got sunlight that is breaking apart DNA on the surface of the flowers, but you've got repeated visits from numerous individuals. So you've got this constant deposition that could be building up. In addition, one of the things we don't know in flower systems, but we do know in aquatic systems, is that rain events can cause a pulse and, and wash that DNA downstream or away entirely. And so rain events may be resetting the flowers themselves. Uh, and so I think it's, it's going to be a complex interaction of all these factors. You know, for this, it was a limited scope study, so we didn't do things like sample immediately after a rain event or immediately at the end of a very sunny day or over long term. Um, but your, 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 your point is well taken that absolutely repeated visits could lead to accumulation of DNA. So as you harvest a flower towards the end of its flowering cycle, you may in fact uh, recover a much larger community. However, the mitigating factors of UV radiation, of rainfall, may also be playing a role. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, like I said, eDNA is, is still uh, methodologically in, a, in its infancy. And so these are a lot of questions that we're actively involved in trying to, to get answers for you for. Thank you, Mark. Now we know that you like The Simpsons and you also like bourbon. Um, so Can confirm. That, let's <laughs> confirm or deny. All right, excellent. At this point, I'd love to pull Liba back into this discussion uh, and, and ask you questions that you both hopefully can weigh in on. Um, we've heard you both speak about very exciting uh, tools that DOD managers could harness to meet their regulatory responsibilities um, as they pertain to threatened and endangered species. Are you aware of some relatively new and innovative tools that you did not discuss uh, on today's webinar. Well, why don't we start with you, Liba? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So, you know, beyond habitat crediting programs, which I talked about today, there's a whole suite of really interesting tools that I think DOD could explore and has already explored in some cases uh, that relate to um, reducing 
uh, regulatory burden and protecting threatened and endangered species and also candidate species. So these include conservation easements, which are not really that new, but I think are increasingly recognized as a powerful tool um, by DOD, especially in buffer areas around installations to meet multiple goals. So conservation easements, uh, for those that are less familiar, is a way for uh, an organization like DOD to, uh, to essentially purchase the development rights uh, from a private landowner. So the private landowner now continues to own and manage their land, um, but that land is protected as open space essentially indefinitely. Uh, so, but it's still owned, uh, privately managed and owned. And what that provides DOD is this buffer around their installation um, from, from the impacts of sound and light in both directions. Uh, so from DOD to surrounding communities and from communities to the DOD installation. And it also has great potential by protecting that open space to provide a place um, for spillover of threatened and endangered species or active uh, partnerships with private landowners to provide habitat for those species, which then increases the overall population and could reduce uh, regulatory burden on that particular installation. And in some cases, uh, conservation easements can occur in a coordinated way uh, to, in order to create habitat connectivity among and between installations across the landscape. So there's actually a large network of protected land uh, that links installations, these buffer areas, uh, to, to each other. So that's a really powerful tool. Um, one other that I'll mention that, you know, DOD has actually really been a pioneer in in the southeast, but I'm not sure if this has been used elsewhere, is the idea of translocation cooperatives. So these, this in particular in the southeast, this is the focus, the focal species here has been the red cockaded woodpecker. And they've created this really innovative program where they're literally exchanging animals, so individual red cockaded woodpeckers, where some installations and other federal, state agencies, and private landowners, too, may either have a, quote, surplus of red cockaded woodpeckers, so maybe more than they can support. They've already reached a maximum capacity in the habitat they have, while others are actively looking to accept and restore red cockaded woodpeckers on their property. So that's another really neat uh, way to, and overall, this, this translocation cooperative has been incredibly successful in recovering the population of red cockaded woodpeckers, perhaps you know, to the extent that that species could be downlisted or delisted, which provides benefits to everyone, the species and all of the organizations involved in this project. The last one that I'll mention is this a really new idea that's called pop-up habitat. And this is something actually where the Nature Conservancy, an environmental nonprofit, has played a really strong role in innovating around this idea. And it's mostly occurred in California uh, in agricultural areas. And the idea is, is that it's possible that instead of doing agreements that are in perpetuity, there may be opportunities to be much more adaptive to changing habitat requirements of species, say those that are migrating through an area, or with climate change, habitat, suitable habitat may shift over time. And what pop up habitats allow is that in any given year, an organization like DOD, or in this case, the Nature Conservancy, uh, could invest funds through a competitive bid project, uh, a bid process with private landowners to temporarily provide habitat uh, for key threatened and endangered species or candidate species during critical periods in their annual life cycle. So to be more specific, in California, this is really focused on waterfowl and uh, shorebirds. And so it's in farmers are flooding fields instead of, say, harvesting uh, products during or being active in their fields during certain times of the year. And that's providing a short term but very high quality habitat for these species and they receive payment to compensate for any lost production in that landscape. So in terms of thinking about resilience to environmental change, um, non-stationarity, I think pop-up habitats are potentially a really valuable tool and would be similar to habitat crediting programs and that they would engage DOD with partnering actively with uh, private landowners and also state and federal agencies uh, perhaps that own land in the same region are interested in collaboratively managing the same species of conservation concern. Thank you. Thank you, Lee Bamar. Uh, 
would you have anything to add to Levi's response? Uh, I, I will, but I'll go in a totally different direction. You know, there, there are two big things that are exciting to me that, that's, that's coming online on DoD lands. Uh, I'll talk a little about them and then uh, selfishly why I'm excited about it. So remote sensing technology is giving us uh, unparalleled pictures of uh, the ecosystems that we work in. And so the ability to have this fine scale resolution uh, data for our ecosystems is opening the door for very complex and accurate habitat suitability models. So we can build out these predictive models uh, at a given installation to get an idea of, all right, based on the ecology of the species and the landscape characteristics, the environmental characteristics, where might these things optimally occur? And then selfishly, I love this because we can build out these models and then it helps tell me where I need to go with my eDNA sampling. And then are these things where we think they are? And so coupling remote sensing with complex habitat suitability models and eDNA, I think it's going to be a great way, again, to think about how we maximize the return on investment. Look, the number of dollars dedicated to conservation aren't getting any bigger. So we're increasingly having to do more with less. And I think this allows us to be much more efficient and facile in doing that. Great. Thank you so much to both of you for a fascinating webinar. Just a last uh, few reminders before we wrap up here. Our next webinar is on Thursday, September 10, and it will feature tools to reduce or eliminate the use of hazardous metals in DOD weapon, uh, weapons applications. We'll have uh, three speakers on this webinar. Frank Campo and Mark Miller from the U.S. Army Bennett Laboratories, and Mr. Aaron uh, Nardi from the U.S. Army Weapons and Materials Research Directorate. Registration is open for uh, this and other future webinars, so please visit the sort of uh, an ESCCP webinar webpage for registration information. Uh, before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can please take a moment to complete a very short survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.